uh, in China. Uh, always people come to me to, uh, asking, you know, now we see innovation everywhere, newspaper, in the media, and all the uh, reports and the government policy uh, guidelines. And uh, everybody talk about this, but we still do not know how to innovate. How to innovate. And they are looking for answers, looking for solutions, lo looking for strategy. And uh, today I try to make a small contribution and uh, sharing some of my thoughts um, on this topic. Um, this is a policy paper, so you won't be able to see the formulas, uh, Greek symbols, or data uh, regressions that I usually do is on policy, but based on theory, based on empirical evidence. Why innovation now becomes such an important uh, topic uh, in China's economic growth? Um, it has been neglected or the has not received attention it deserves for a long time, for a long time. China's economic growth since the reforms has been driven by the reforms in the agricultural sector, reforms in the state-owned sector, reforms of the price system, and also opening up, attract FDI and the firms going abroad, uh, exporting and, uh, and the investment. And the innovation, it is until the late 1990s the government has recognized that innovation should be one of the main drivers for economic growth of China and also the fundamental, the very important one for long-term economic growth and the development for China. And uh, at this stage, why it has some special importance is because innovation also is one of the, 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 the drivers to pull a country out of the possible middle income trap. This diagram actually shows the growth trajectory of South Korea, of Taiwan, of Malaysia, and of Japan. This um, curve is the growth. This is the income level of all these countries as a percentage of the US living standard, as a percentage of the US living standard. The highest one is Japan. We can see from the 90s, early 1960s to the mid 1970s, Japan has shown a fast catch up process. And it's closing its gap with the United States. There are other two economies have done very well. These are South Korea and Taiwan. They have shown rapid catch-up process in the 1970s, 80s, and the 90s, and 90s. However, we also can see another middle-income country, which in the 1960s, whose income level is even higher than South Korea and uh, Taiwan, this is Malaysia. However, Malaysia has remained almost at the same level you know, slightly increased its uh, income and narrowed its gap with the US over 40 years, over 40 years. So some countries have, you know, catch up, but some countries haven't failed to do so. Why? What's the major differences between these countries and those failed to catch up? Those still being trapped in the middle income trap. One of the main characteristics of Japan, Korea, and Taiwan is they have made great, much greater efforts in innovation, especially indigenous innovation capabilities building, than other middle-income countries like Malaysia. There are other middle-income countries like Brazil, like uh, Philippines, like Thailand, uh, like uh, um, Indonesia. They are even you know, lower than Malaysia. Malaysia is the best among that group, but still have not uh, catch up. So this suggests that countries who innovate will be able to really move up to the high income group. If you don't doing so, you will stay in the middle income group, being trapped there. 
So in um, what follows in my talk, I will first discuss the theoretical framework that I will use to analyze the policies. The policies should not you know, just come from random. There are rationales behind it for policy intervention. So I'll first discuss the theoretical framework, then briefly review, briefly review the performance, the situation of innovation in China. And then based on the theory, based on China's performance, then discuss some policy recommendations. Finally, I would like to discuss the space for innovation policy <coughs> in the 21st century. What we have learned in the textbooks, you know, many belongs to the 60s, 40s, 70s, and 80s. Now we are in the 21st century. This week, China and the EU had a big trade war on solar PV, and there are other things come. So in the 21st century, what is the space for innovation policy? I want to discuss this. Um, first, I want to have a quick overview about the research on innovation policy in China. China is not uh, short of research in innovation policy. If you do a search, you, know, you can find a lot of uh, papers published in English, especially published in Chinese, and a lot of government commissioned reports on innovation policy, science, and uh, technology policy in China. However, most, almost all of them, are based on the national innovation system approach. This is a diagram showing us the national innovation system approach. <laughs> this um, approach suggests that the innovation is a system work, and including several major players, the government, the business sector, and the public sector, like universities and the institu uh, research institutions. And they interact with each other, and there are linkages with each other. And uh, therefore, the performance depends on the actors and the linkages. Based on this idea, so many of the countries are strengthening the university industry linkage, talking about PPP, government and the private partnership. All of these are, are very nice ideas, very nice ideas. And also, this approach has some um, advantage is it's very easy for policymakers, for practitioners to understand. It's very easy to understand there are, there are um, several players and they interact, the linkage very important. However, the, it does not explain how can I increase the capacity and the innovative, in the innovativeness of all these actors and how to increase, strengthen the linkages so this is the shortcoming. However, currently, the, the, all the, most of the, the, the uh, policy research uh, in China is based on this approach. And China, I have to say, has some, done, done something good, especially in organizing all the, the innovation uh, projects. Like all the, the, the national goal is then decomposed into uh, in several industry goals and the key subjects, uh, key projects, key industries are identified and then there are people organizing all this. So organization has been done very well, although people have not really figured out why should we doing so and how can we make each project effective and efficient, etc. And how to build the innovation capability of the country as a whole. So, um, having recognized the gap in the literature, in the current research, um, in this paper, I, I will choose another approach, a different one. This is the capabilities approach. This capabilities approach suggests that national innovation capacity is determined, you know, it's an outcome of the capabilities, incentives, and also institutional framework and the, the interplay of all these factors. The capabilities of a country will define the best can be achieved. Define the best can be achieved. Incentives 
will guide the use of the capabilities. Guide the use of the capabilities. And uh, the framework is capabilities and incentives have, will work under the framework of institutions. So OECD in um, 1987 has a uh, <coughs> major publication called Structural Adjustment and Economic Performance. And they have a very, um, I think, very clear explanation about the relationship. It says, the capabilities define the best that can be achieved, while the incentives guide the use of capabilities and uh, indeed stimulate the expansion, renewal, and uh, disappearance of the capabilities. Therefore, incentives determine the efficiency with, we, with we, which capabilities are used. And uh, both the incentives and the capabilities operate within an institutional framework. Institutions set rules of the game as well as directly intervening the play. They act to alter capabilities and change incentives. Institutions can alter capabilities and the change incentives. And they can modify the behavior of people, of institution, by changing attitudes and expectations. So these are the uh, relationship between all these three elements and how they together determine the national innovation capabilities. And to make it more concrete, then I made some expansion based on uh, Sanja Lau's 1992 uh, paper. First, capabilities include what? Capabilities first include financial, physical capital. How much we invest in innovation. How much we invest in R&D. Physical capital, I think that's no surprise. Human capital, also no surprise. Because innovation, the key is about idea. Idea come from people, carried by people, created by people. So it's human capital. Also, I want to add the capacity of the state. In the innovation system approach we just have, have seen, the state government is one of the natural players in the natural, national innovation system. Therefore, the capacity of the state to set the right policy, make the appropriate intervention, not over-intervene, you know, not too much uh, withdraw, it just act where it should act and when it should. That's the capacity, and also the technological effort. This technological effort in particular refers to the effort to innovate, to upgrade technology. So this is the capabilities. Uh, um, elements, include all these four uh, factors. Then let's look at incentives. There are macro incentives, including interest rate policy, um, uh, exchange rate, physical policy, you know, lower tax rate uh, for innovation, um, you know, relatively depreciated exchange rate, which encourages exports, means greater markets, greater market means more High, more, higher uh, return for innovation. So all this will have um, impact on firms' motivation to innovate. Of course, interest rates too. If it's easier and cheaper to borrow, firms will more likely to innovate. Of course, there, is, there can be another side of story. Is if it's too easy to survive, firms won't innovate. They don't need to innovate. So this is kind of two sides, a coin of two sides, but the push factor will be larger than the negative factor. Also, there are macro um, incentives. These macro incentives is within, I refer to those incentives within the firm, come from the governance, uh, ownership structure, and human resource um, policies a firm set, you know, whether a firm rewards innovative uh, employees or the better is you, you innovate or not innovate, we treat you the same, which is like the iron ball uh, like China had, um, you know, before the reforms. 
So this micro incentives also matters. And another very important incentives come from the product market, competition. Competition actually is a two-edged sword for innovation. According to the Schubiterium uh, theory, more monopoly means firms more likely to get monopoly rents, and therefore they are more likely to innovate because innovate they get more higher, more likely to get the rents back. Uh, however, also there are scholars like Jaworski um, argues that more competition foster push more innovation. Firms has to innovate in a competitive market so as to survive. So this is another stream of uh, argument. Uh, and the recent research, also led by scholars in, in London Economic School and the IFS, they argue the relationship between competition and the innovation is an inverted U-shape, follows inverted U-shape. So more competition leads to more innovation, but if you have over-innovation, over-competition, then firms very difficult to get the rents investment back from innovation, they are less likely to innovate. So this is argument about uh, competition, but clearly competition plays a very important role here to incentivize innovation. Of course, factor market, like labor market, capital market, whether they are efficient, you know, to provide the labor supply and the capital supply for innovation, also very important. So these are the incentives, incentives. Then institutions. They include legal institution, industrial in institution, training institution, and technological institution. Legal institution in particular refers to, I think, IPR, intellectual property rights protection um, regime. So this, I think everybody are very familiar with the, uh, uh, about this, its importance. And the industrial uh, institution refers to some industrial association, industrial uh, like innovation network platform, which help facilitates knowledge sharing and exchange and innovation within the industry, within the industry. And the training institution uh, in particular refers to some training uh, institutions, including higher education and vocational education uh, uh, institutions, which provide training for the firms. Uh, in the private sector, some large firms have the capacity to provide training for employees, but many of the SMEs, the small firms, uh, lack of this capacity, and uh, some institutional help will help them to train their workers. Finally, technological institution. Uh, for example, some technology transaction market uh, provide a platform and a channel for firms who need knowledge to acquire, find knowledge, and for firms who own a lot of uh, patents to you know, commercialize their uh, knowledge. This exists in China, but they are not really functional well. Um, I talk to people in China uh, who manages the technology transaction market. It has been there since 1980s. But they said, very often when we are close to the deal, firms find you know, better for them to do the transaction outside the, the, the market because they don't need to pay the fee. And uh, that's why the, the transaction uh, market does not really work. <coughs> Uh, in China. Uh, now they are now trying to make a lot of efforts to renew the role of these intermediaries, technology intermediaries. So these uh, are the three elements and of course now with the globalization, uh, with interna internationalization of R&D and the openness and the use of global resources, global talents, global knowledge really has become an opportunity for all the countries who open up their innovation system and their economic system. And the openness can affect capabilities if we allow foreign firms in, allow talents, you know, migration, highly skilled um, migrants to come, strengthens capability. They will also provide incentives because more competition will force firms to innovate. And they may, you know, 
have some uh, direct or impact, the indirect impact on institutions. So this is the theoretical framework um, I will use for the analysis. Now, before the analysis, I want to you know, um, briefly uh, overview China's um, performance in innovation. China's innovation, I think, in recent years has grown very fast, has grown very fast, since, especially since 19, late, mid-1990s. The investment in R&D, the growth is exponential. And also, in, this is in terms of inputs, R&D expenditure. If we look at outputs measured by patent granted, and uh, we can see China also outperforms other four BRICS countries, outperforms India, Brazil, Russia, and South Africa. China does fairly well in the past 10 years, in the past 10 years. So this are good news. However, those are indicators, either single indicators of input and output. However, a country's innovation performance, especially its capability, is multi-faceted and needs to be measured, you know, a comprehensive measurement uh, people have developed is using some indication uh, system, a score system. And the European Commission has developed a system using 25 indicators measuring the in enablers, the firm activities in innovation and outputs performance in innovation. They combine all these um, 25 indicators from human resource to, to financial resource to institution to firm uh, innovation performance to, uh, you know, to, to the university's performance, etc., including the SMEs. And uh, what is the score? What do we expect? Where is China in the, wo in the world? Here is the answer. China is here. So Korea? The United States get the highest score. Japan also, you know, very close to the, these two, very high. The EU 27 is slightly uh, lower than Korea, US, and Japan, but this is the average. P please know this is the average of 27 EU countries. There are very, there are, there are several star countries like Finland, Norway, Sweden, Germany. They are here. They are here. And uh, the innovation score of China is around a quarter, you know, 40% of that of South Korea and the US. So this is where China is, about half of that of Japan. This is China's innovation uh, performance overall. This is an aggregate score. And uh, looking at the gaps in individual areas, this is compare China to the EU 27 countries. All the, the, the scores, the positive scores means China doing better. The positive scores means China doing better. This is comparing the level. Comparing the level, China only doing better than the EU in terms of number of doctoral graduates because of the population. So China only, only doing better than the EU in terms of doctoral graduates. Then in other aspects, in other aspects in terms of uh, tertiary education proportion and the uh, publication, R&D expenditure, R&D expenditure by, by the public and the, the private sector and the patent and the uh, high tech exports, et cetera, all lag behind, all lag behind. And uh, the good news is in terms of changes, changes, China outperforms the EU in, term, in most of the areas. Of course, this is 2013 data. So EU has been in the crisis for several years. So their investment in R&D and their innovation activity may be affected by the crisis. So the changes um, in China uh, the, 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 the advantage that China enjoys, we have to take into account. For you, maybe a short-term temporary, um, you know, withdrawal. So this is, uh, but I think China's catching up. We can see from those diagrams, China has invested uh, 
very quickly, increased very quickly in terms of R&D and uh, other innovation um, activities. So this is the, 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 the performance. And China also faced very urgently the issue of industrial upgrading. Looking at China's exports, these are the sectors showing sectors China has the international competitive advantage. Most of the products come from the low-tech sector, nearly 60%. The median tech is 12%. Of course, there are 17%, around 17% in the high-tech sector. But I want to say this 17% in the high-tech sector, we have to you know, watch very carefully. Because in this 17% high-tech exports, more than 90% of China's high-tech exports are based on processing trade mode. So China import the spare parts, assemble it with the, 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 the unskilled labor in the uh, special economic zone and re-export it. The value added and the skill content in China's assembly activity is very limited. It's very, very limited. And uh, the most famous example is the iPhone example. Maybe many of you have heard about this story. The iPhone, the first generation of iPhone was sold in the market uh, at the price of 600. The cost is about 300. And among these 300 costs, we all know more than about 95, 96% of China, uh, the iPhones uh, sold in the world are some assembled. Uh, in China. And then what did China earn? 6.5 US dollar. So out of this 300 cost, China earned 6.5 dollar. Therefore, the value added is really uh, limited. And China faced an urgent task to upgrade its industrial structure and its capability, its technological capability. Then how can we do? What are the policy suggestions? The recommendations one, regarding capabilities. Um, I think China should continue to increase its investment in R&D. It has done very well in the past 10 years and should continue this. And especially increase the investment in basic research in basic research. Previously, more than 90%, 95% of the investment goes to development, not basic research. Now should increase the investment in basic research. The second is nurtured creativity. I think everybody knows this. I won't today spend more time on this because this deserves another uh, presentation, another paper about how to nurture the creativity. I think this reform means the reform of the education system, not the university, but also in, from the nursery, uh, how to reform the whole system. The third, I want to explain a bit more, is about the utilization of international knowledge and talents to enhance China's uh, innovation capacity. In terms of the num number of scientists and engineers, China is no short of. However, the star talents, star engineers and the scientists with the, you know, a high level of creativity, China is short of. We need this type of uh, uh, leaders in different uh, disciplines. And uh, this is not a Nurture, talent is not a short-term um, project, it's long-term. In short-term, the solution will be to utilize international talents. Open up the system, attract not only returnees, you know, Chinese scientists, engineers trained abroad, but also you know, international talents. In the, you, no matter which country they come from, US, Europe, or Africa, everywhere use international talents um, and also the multinational uh, companies to set up, attract them to set up their uh, laboratory in China. I noticed, I remember for some time, there are headlines in China and India, these two countries are celebrating that multinationals are moving their 
lapse. So China and the India and the relocate. Of course, EU and the US are worried, very naturally. And the EU has commissioned several projects on this, want to find out what's the real story. And all the, the research found out there is no hollowing out effect. The core research, the lead research, the research of the highest sophistication and advancement are all remained in Europe. No hollowing out effect. So I think that's the truth China has to realize. Uh, not you know, celebrating too early. Oh, Microsoft set up a, a lab there, but we don't know what they are really doing there. Uh, so this is about the, the talent. Or, of course, SME and the private sector. These are the sectors in China currently still being discriminated and short of resources. They are, in the EU, they are the most dynamic driving forces of innovation, but in China, they are under-resourced and uh, underfunded and provide funding, information, and training for the private sector, for the, for the SMEs. I think this is an area the government should tackle. Second is about incentives. Today, I may spend a bit more on this because I think this has been ignored. Um, for a long time. When we talk about innovation, how can we make China more innovative? Okay, yeah. Um, people think about, we invest, we have money. You know, invest a lot of money, spend money, and they, that's why it leads to the problem about efficiency. Very low efficient, efficiency in China's innovation uh, at the moment. So, the first is about the reforms. I think it's the, this is the macro issue about reform of economic system. Because currently there are state-owned sector, there are uh, private, you know, uh, private sector, and there are sectors with free entry to the, to everybody. But there are sectors with restrictions. Only the state firms or you or those who have good relationship with the government can enter. Therefore, many of the firms want to enter those sectors to to get the rent, higher rents, to real estate, to other sectors, and therefore. The resource has not been allocated efficiently within the economy and has not been relocated to the sectors which need, need resources, the innovative sector which urgently need resources. So we need to reform the system, increase competition, fair competition, so that resources can be allocated efficiently and being directed to the uh, innovation sector. The second is about better use of human resource management practices. People haven't talked about this at all, but this is really very important. First is wage system. Now, the, the most clever kids in China very likely going to, they come to the UK, I know many of them going to the business school, they want to do finance. Going to the uh, science and engineering sector want to become a physicist. You know, think about that. Uh, in, in the uh, natural science chemistry uh, um, department, much less kids would like to go there because of job opportunity, because of the wages. So we need to reform the age system and give higher returns to scientists, engineers, and attract the best talent to the sector. Second is appraisal, reward, and promotion criteria in the university and in the research center and in the uh, firms. Let's take university as an example. First, we should tell people quality is more important than quantity. Now people in China gradually re recognize this. So they always want to publish in SSCI index journal, not other journal, because SSCI means quality. Um, anyway, this is too mechanical, but it's a good sign moving to the right direction. And the reward, uh, like the PhD student now required to publish two, three papers in some very high quality journal within the three years of PhD, which is impossible in our system. It's impossible. So how to set the tar target, you know, to allow major piece of research, give the rational lens, five years, not three years, three paper means one paper, one year, it, it, it's impossible. 
for high quality research, you know, sets the reward system uh, and the appraisal system um, appropriately. And also give the reasonable time span and also the promotion criteria. Whether you just pub publish paper enough or for engineers, you have to patent it. This is different. If you, the policy stops at patent, the firms just, uh, the, 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 the faculty, the scientists just the patent. They don't do any transfer and commercialization. If your assessment criteria include impact, include your knowledge transfer to the real economy, to the industrial sector, of course the faculty, the, the members, the scientists will do this. So change the, the, uh, the appraisal system and the promotion system, like what we do in IEF in the UK. We have impact. Uh, every five, seven years, there is an assessment. You only need four papers, and of course, high quality papers. You don't waste, waste resources to do low quality things, and also, impact is assessed. And also, tolerance to failure. And uh, also, reform the funding system and appraisal methods, which you know, I have discussed earlier. And also, all this, I think, based on the culture. The culture rewards innovation and also a culture take reputation and honesty seriously. If honesty is not really you know, taken seriously, everybody can lie or make things up and the, the opportunity cost, the cost of, of doing so is very low, then people do this. Now all this, this appraisal system, all these reforms means nothing. Because if you, you allow people lie, and allow them to, to, to go on. So honesty and reputation need to be you know, put at a high uh, priority. So this is about the institutional development. I, I want, uh, because of time constraint, and also you know, because IPR, in, in intellectual property rights protection, everybody are very familiar. I don't uh, spend much time on this. China is improving, have done a good job, but still need to do more and also develop the intermediary markets, technology markets, to provide the platform for firms to acquire knowledge and to transfer knowledge. And the interplays. The interplay is very important. For a large country like China, really need coordination. Need coordination. Otherwise, different provinces, different regions, or different ministries have their own interest, and they say different things, or they do things repeatedly, or or completely very differently contradict to each other. We need uh, coordination, and then this coordination need to set at a high level. My suggestion is we need an innovation working group at the high level led by one of the, the, the prime minister or deputy uh, uh, prime minister to coordinate, because innovation is not only science and technology. Innovation is about the whole system, from education to, to R&D to the business sector about commercialization, but also needs the financial support, the tax system, the bank, uh, the, 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 the Ministry of Trade, all have to work together. And this uh, coordination, like many of the things, we need a high-level working group to lead this and coordinate this. All the ministers should be members of this group, and the prime minister should lead this. Uh, and also, of course, I, I mentioned, need to communicate the right concept of innovation to the community and the economy. Innovation is not only science and technology. It's not only the business of the scientists. It's the whole whole system, from government to the salespeople, to the salespeople. Um, and of course, why coordination is important? Because you need balanced performance. The, in the EU, people find out the best countries in terms of innovation, they, are, they have very balanced performance. They are good on every aspect. If you have an aspect very weak, this is like a, the barrel principle, you know, all the water will will leak out from your barrel if you have one, one side of the barrel is short, is short. Um, five is about openness, about integration into the global innovation system. Uh, in the 21st century, we cannot avoid this. And what China should do is to fully participate and make use, it, use of it, and using some non-conventional modes. 
People used to talk about imports, about inward FDI. Now we should talk about non-conventional modes. This includes collaborative innovation, include outward direct investment, you know, merge and acquisition and the direct invest in the UK, in the US, about the use of mobility of highly skilled people. These are the non-conventional modes we should use. And also actively participate in the international standard making and the international organizations. China needs such kind of scientists and engineers, not only good in their science and the research, but also good at communication, organizing things, and take a lead in the international organizations, fully participate. So if I highlight, I would like to say the reforms uh, fair competition and the resource allocation is one of the key. Second is use human resource management and the funding resource management practices and incentives to, uh, to strengthen incentives. Finally, use international knowledge. Uh, before I conclude, I want to mention about the space for innovation policy in the 21st century. Uh, before innovation policy, people talk about industrial policy. Industrial policy has, is now very infamous. People dislike it because of those winner picking uh, 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 industrial policy. Now, this is relabeled and transformed. It's called, now called, called, called as innovation policy in many developed countries. In the US, they have innovation policy. In the UK, in Germany, in France, they all have innovation policy. They may do you know, something similar to the uh, industrial policy, although they they do not close their door. They do not do very clear winner-picking uh, selective policy. So my suggestion to the Chinese government, first is use more poor policy rather than push policy. Because of WTO, you cannot force people to do anything. In the country, you have to create things and attract people to pull people here, attract people here. Second, second use more horizontal policy versus selective policy. Horizontal policy means those policy benefits everybody. Education policy, R&D policy, training policy, this horizontal policy. This policy complying with the WTO rule, nobody can complain with the country by invest a lot in education. But if you do winner picking, I pick solar PV industry and invest, give a lot of subsidy, then you will have problem. So more horizontal versus selective. And more demand, more policy to encourage demand and create better environment rather than supply. You know, I give you subsidy, you produce more, uh, more products or innovation. Uh, and also, I think one thing very important for China is it needs to clarify and communicate correctly and thoroughly the meaning of indigenous innovation. Because indigenous innovation, this concept come out, many of the, 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 the foreign friends that I know, they say, oh, China is going back to the closed door policy. You are going to do indigenous innovation. You are going to create things yourself. You are not going to need our technology, not going to communicate with others. But in fact, indigenous innovation means, you know, to achieve something that you will enjoy or share its uh, intellectual property rights. This can be achieved through you doing housely or collaboratively or acquire and modification. So I think this concept should be communicated to the outside world uh, correctly and, and, and thoroughly. Finally, just a reminder about policy. We talk a lot, lot about policy. I don't mean policy government is a panacea, can save everybody. Uh, Stiglitz has made uh, a statement. I think uh, it's very good, and I want to use this also to, to conclude uh, my presentation. Is governments also face information and incentive programs no less than does the private sector. We need to recognize both the limits and strengths of the market, as well as the strengths and the limits of the government intervention aimed at correcting market failures. That's all. Thank you.